Hey everyone, welcome back to the Gaining Health Podcast. It's me, your host, Carly Burridge, and I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Benjamin Bickman. Dr. Bickman earned his PhD in bioenergetics and was a postdoctoral fellow of the Duke National University of Singapore studying metabolic disorders. Currently, his professional focus as a scientist and professor at BYU is to better understand the role of elevated insulin and nutrient metabolism in regulating obesity, diabetes, and dementia. And he frequently publishes his research in peer-reviewed journals and presents at international science meetings. And he is the author of the best-selling book and my personal favorite medical book that has been written. And that says a lot because, well, you can't see my bookcase behind me, but I've read a lot of them and I love this one. It is called Why We Get Sick, The Hidden Epidemic at the Root of Most Chronic Disease and How to Fight It. And I'm very honored and excited to have you here with us today. Welcome. Thank you, Carly. That's a wonderful introduction, and it is wonderful to connect with you again. I have loved our interaction in the past, and I expect this will be just as good. Yes, I'm so excited. So last time we saw each other was, well, I guess it was back in September when uh, we had invited you to Chicago to come speak at the Illinois Obesity Society meeting. And I know we had, we had kind of started our conversation about, you know, how did you get started in this field? And then, you know, these these conferences or these meetings are busy. And I think we, we got, got sidetracked. I think you were helping Silvana with her technology issue. Yeah. <laughs> So in addition to speaking for us, you are also our tech support. So thank you. (laughs) But we started talking about um, what got you interested in insulin and insulin resistance and metabolism. Like, how did that journey start for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there are probably I, I think there are two pivotal moments for me. The first one happened during my master's degree when I had stumbled across a paper that had been published just a few years prior. So this is late. Uh, this was late late nineties when this work came out, and the manuscript detailed uh, a, a phenomenon wherein the fat cells, when they started to grow, started to secrete pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines. In other words, activating the immune system to basically fight an infection that wasn't there. And this convergence of immune system and metabolism or immunometabolism just lit up my my brain. I I was dumbfounded and and delighted at the same time by what I just learned. And, And there were some interesting moments for me with that one realization, some of which was just learning that fat cells are endocrine, the fat tissue is an endocrine organ, that fat right. tissue secretes hormones, a whole bunch of hormones. And that was a revelation to me. And then a second, uh, well, and I should add at the time also, that started to bridge a gap in our understanding between how uh, how did, uh, how did was obesity and diabetes related, type 2 diabetes. And, and so I had imagined this pathway, which has certainly played out, which is that a fat cell becomes large and becomes pro-inflammatory. And that increased inflammation starts to promote insulin resistance. Now, I didn't know the mechanism at the time. And then the insulin resistance was foundational to type 2 diabetes. And so that was in my mind as I started my PhD work. And during the course of my PhD, we were treating animals with insulin at one point of some experiments. And even though the animals were eating the exact same amount of food, the animals that were getting the insulin injections to be hyperinsulinemic were fatter than the other animals were. Uh, And and that to me was impossible because I had been taught uh, over my years that obesity was a matter purely a a thermodynamic phenomenon, that if there's more calories coming in than out, then the animal would gain weight. I'm not saying that sentiment isn't true. I believe thermodynamics does matter. But if we try to understand thermodynamics in a living organism without the role of hormones like insulin, then we don't really evaluate all the variables. Um, and, and we can get into that more if we'd like, but nevertheless, it was those two moments, understanding fat cells better and then understanding the, the uniquely fattening effects of insulin, which I'd never really appreciated or considered. That got me firmly planted through my fellowship and then now as an independent investigator or professor scientist. Uh, And that interest has not waned even a little. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, we've been studying insulin for so long. And I think some of this, 
has been known for a while, right? Because like I remember the first time that I was really introduced to insulin, and I think we talked about this too, I was in graduate school for clinical exercise physiology, and this must have been in like 2005-ish, and we weren't talking about weight at all. We were talking about substrate utilization in athletes, right, or, or just in people in general. Like, what substrate are we using? Are we using fat as a fuel source? Are we using glucose as a fuel source? And um, what we saw was just this graph of insulin and fat utilization or lipolysis, right? Breaking down of fat to use fat as a fuel source. And I just saw that graph. And I like, for me, that was my light bulb moment where I realized something else was going in on in the body, especially when it comes to body weight regulation that nobody had ever talked about. You ne- I never heard about that before. You know, it was always just, well, it's a matter of calories in, calories out. And, you know, up until this point, it had been mostly, you know, the low fat mantra because it was like, well, fat has more calories in it than, you know, proteins and carbs. So if you want to cut down on your calories, you should cut down on your fat. And that was really the only message that that I had ever really heard or that made sense to me. And that makes total sense, right? If you know, calories has four, if uh, fat has four calories per gram and proteins and carbs or fat has nine calories per gram and protein and carbs have four calories per gram, then that, that makes sense. Right. And so when I saw that graph, like something in my mind switched, like, oh my gosh, well, the higher your insulin, the less you're able to burn fat, including your own body fat as a fuel source. And for me, this had been a journey kind of, a realization more about myself, honestly, because when I moved to the US from Europe in 2000, I had that experience that a lot of people have when they moved to the US. I had gained about 20 or 30 pounds in a year. That and also, I mean, I guess it's just the freshman 15 and just double that. Yeah. <laughs> and But I was like super active. I was an athlete. I was playing volleyball. I was conditioning. At this time when I was taking that course, I'd stopped playing volleyball, but I was training for a marathon. I mean, I couldn't be more active. And yet the 20 or 30 pounds that I had gained, like I could never lose it. And I was so frustrated and I was just always hungry and hangry, you know? So for me, that was kind of a, I discovered it sort of on a personal level, but that graph just, that just always stuck with me. And I started experimenting with myself, just changing my nutrition and things like that. And found it made a huge difference. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, I was in PA school. And I just remember, I mean, first of all, we didn't learn any of this. But I do remember when we were learning how to treat diabetes. And during this time, sulfonylureas were still like, you know, that was your go to. And I was like, wait, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, why are we giving people something that gives them more insulin when clearly they already have too much insulin, but it's just not working. So anyways, All that to say is I think, you know, some of this information about insulin and its role in fat metabolism has been known for a long time, but it's just, we don't think about it in the context of obesity and all of these other medical conditions. Um, And you talk about, you talk about the connection of, of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, obviously with, with obesity and type two diabetes, which I think a lot of people are able to make that connection between insulin resistance and type two diabetes. But then you also talk about things like cancer and hypertension Mm -hmm. and infertility and erectile dysfunction and how all of those things tie into insulin resistance. So can you talk to us a little bit more about Mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah. And and before we get into the peripheral ones, even type two diabetes, I, I like the way you teed this up by pointing out some of the flaw in how we medicate a person with type two diabetes, which, which is reflective of our glucose centric paradigm. And what I mean by that is we look at diabetes as diseases of glucose and that's not wrong. It's just not as right as the alternative, which is that these are diseases of insulin and they're diseases of opposites. Whereas type one diabetes is a disease of an insulin deficiency. It's, it's absent. Type two diabetes is a disease of insulin excess. And now it's this particularly problematic combination of, of both high insulin, hyperinsulinemia, as you noted, which, which I'll come to in just a sec, and insulin not working particularly well throughout the body. Now, it's not a universal phenomenon. This is very, very important. As I briefly explain some of the unique pathologies or problems that are derivative of insulin resistance, 
we have to define insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is a problem with two parts. The one part is that insulin isn't working properly at certain cells of the body. I didn't say all cells of the body. So many cells are still responding to insulin perfectly fine. But at the same time, the body has hyperinsulinemia. And that means the cells that are still sensitive to insulin are now getting flooded with insulin and now they're doing too much. So um, this is a good segue or a good opportunity to segue into some of the problems like infertility. You mentioned infertility. The most common forms of infertility in men and women are erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovary syndrome respectively. In men, it's a problem of insulin resistance. Although remember, these things, everyone listening, always happen together. Insulin resistance is hyperinsulinemia and vice versa. They always come together. And in the case of the man, as I noted, um, with erectile dysfunction, his blood vessels have become resistant to insulin's effects. And one of insulin's many, many effects is to induce the production of a molecule called nitric oxide at blood vessels. And when insulin, induces, when insulin induces the production of nitric oxide, it will allow blood vessels to dilate, increasing blood flow throughout the body. And of course, in the case of erectile dysfunction, that would be obviously relevant. But if his blood vessels have become insulin resistant, now he does not experience that dilation. The blood vessels stay constricted. And again, uh, I mean, the outcome is obvious. He has erectile dysfunction. At the same time, he probably has elevated blood pressure or hypertension in, in, throughout his body because his blood vessels are just too constricted. Now, in the female counterpart, in her case, with polycystic ovary syndrome, one of the most common causes is the hyperinsulinemia. Insulin is known to have an effect on an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase is this oft overlooked enzyme, but it's essential, particularly in female physiology, because within the ovaries, and to a lesser, much, much lesser degree in the testes, insulin uh, aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone into the estrogens. And so naturally, there's a lot of that happening in a female, particularly during her ovulatory cycle, where she has to have this really, really big spike in estrogens in order for ovulation to actually happen. But if the insulin is high, that's inhibiting the ovary's ability to flood the system with all these estrogens. And so her estrogens don't get high enough. And so she has ovaries that end up creating a lot of follicles, as happens every cycle. And rather than one of them popping out and ovulating, which tells all the other follicles to now go away back into nothing, none of we never have an actual ovulation because of the absence of the estrogen spike. So all of those follicles stick around in the ovary, making the ovary get bigger and that's uncomfortable. And then the same thing can happen the next cycle and the next cycle. So the, again, to put a fine point on it, the elevated insulin prevents the estrogen spike and the lack of an estrogen spike causes a lack of ovulation and the lack of ovulation results in follicles that just don't know what to do. And they kind of linger around making the ovaries get bigger and bigger and ultimately contributing to PCOS, not to mention the, well, contributing to her infertility in particular, um, but not to mention the effects of the higher uh, testosterone, because if she's producing less estrogens, by default, she's producing more testosterone, then that gives rise to some of the um, other more uncomfortable aspects of PCOS, if not the infertility that may be causing her acne or maybe causing male pattern baldness or, you know, top of the head baldness. Um, and even more body hair, hirsutism, where she might have hair down her face or more coarse hair on her arms and legs. So that's, that's, these are known. So the infertility is an interesting example. Then just because you mentioned it, uh, even the most common forms of cancer, breast and prostate cancers, once again, each one reflective of the sexes, while the insulin resistance is very, it's not likely that the insulin resistance is causing the problem. I wouldn't say that, but it's exacerbating the problem it's amplifying it, where we know that insulin promotes cell growth. And in particular, prostate and breast tumors are known to overexpress insulin receptors. And so more insulin receptors means these are cells that can respond better to insulin's pro-growth signal. And when you combine that with the tendency of this person to always be eating starches and sugars, well, that's the fuel for cancer. 
cancer cells use glucose 20 times higher than normal cells do. And so not only are we telling the cells to grow because of the high insulin, which is, rel which is always present in insulin resistance, but then we're giving them all the fuel they need to grow by flooding the system with all that glucose. So we could go on and on through other tissues of the body, but this is a, the primary reason why I so heartily and without any regret to this day, have devoted my career to insulin resistance. It was, it was because I learned more and more, yes, this is a problem relevant to type 2 diabetes, which alone makes it important. But when you consider the fact that insulin resistance is a fundamental part of all of the, what I like to call the plagues of prosperity, all of these modern chronic diseases, then we have tremendous advantage because rather than an individual patient taking their pill for their PCOS and their migraine headaches and their hypertension, um, what we can do is educate them on the fact that all of these, while each having distinct causes, share a common cause in the form of insulin resistance. Then we could say, you have problems associated with insulin resistance. Then the patient would say, well, how can I improve my insulin resistance? Our response would be, the best way is the food we eat because the food we eat is either the culprit or the cure. It's either contributing to the problem or it's contributing to the cure. And so with a little bit of education and some help, because it can be hard to change habits, of course, the patient can resolve their insulin resistance, thereby reducing their risk of virtually every chronic disease. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how much affecting one hormone, how much that can affect the whole body. And you said just every cell in the body has insulin receptors, right? And we only hear about insulin's role in medicine. We typically only hear about insulin's role as it relates to blood glucose regulation. Mm -hmm. But you say that that's its most famous role, but that's certainly right. not its only role. It has many roles and perhaps not even its most important role. So I, I absolutely, think, you know, yes, you're quoting me well. I would, I, it, is <laughs> not, it is not its most important. It's just the most famous. Insulin does, it is so essential to a cell knowing what to do with the energy that it has available to it that every, literally, as you noted, every cell has insulin receptors. The body does not know what to do with its energy in the absence of insulin, which is why an absence of insulin is a death sentence. Type one diabetes, before the discovery of insulin, the child would die uh, it was, and, and not even very long. There are many, many other hormones you can get rid of and the person won't die or their demise is much slower, but remove insulin it's rapidly lethal and give the child a few weeks, maybe months, and very likely the child would pass away. So it's just reflective of just how essential insulin is to literally every cell of the body. Right. So it is so essential, so important. And now we're running into the problem that you say over 50% of the U.S. population has insulin resistance, and the vast majority of people have no idea, right? And I would even say most medical providers have no idea about this. You start talking about insulin. The only thing they think is, well, that's, you know, something that, you know, we give to type two diabetics when they get to that point where if they, if they need insulin or to type one diabetics. But other than that, they don't know anything about insulin. And yet it affects human health to such, such a degree, you know? So first of all, let me uh, ask you, for providers who want to start screening patients and looking for insulin resistance in their patients, what do you think is the best way for them to screen patients for insulin resistance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's not surprising, it shouldn't be, that if we are trying to understand a problem called insulin resistance, we probably should measure insulin. And that's mm -hmm. where so many clinicians have been, um, have been, well, I would say poorly educated you know, we only know what we what we've learned, and so it's not it's not fair of me to expect everyone to know what I know. Just like I don't know what anyone else would know. Um, but yeah, with regards to insulin resistance, some tests that I would encourage any clinician to do one would just be measuring fasting insulin, and if the fasting insulin levels are above six microunits per mil, that's a concern, or it's a reason to do the additional tests that I'll mention. Um, um, one of the easier ones to do is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And that is just triglycerides divided by HDL. And if that number is higher than around 1.5 or 2, and there's some um, differences across ethnicities, which is why we have to be a little more careful with that one, um, just inherent differences. But nevertheless, if that number is higher than about 2, that's a red flag. Um, another one that's very, very predictive 
um, is the triglyceride glucose index. And this is one that just keeps getting, I'm amazed at how many papers just keep coming out about this one. And it's a little more of a complicated formula, so anyone could look it up. But the nice thing about the triglyceride glucose index is that we always get those numbers. We always get glucose. We always get triglycerides, just like we always get HDL. So that other ratio I just mentioned is helpful. And then my favorite one, um, but it requires measure another atypical marker, which is free fatty acids. We don't normally measure free fatty acids. Now, you and I know this, but I just want to pause for just a second and just teach this because I'm amazed at how many of my own students, you know, university students who've gone through nutrient metabolism courses, they don't know the difference between free fatty acids and triglycerides. So tri a tr the triglyceride number on the clinical test is the amount of the actual molecule. Well, it's kind of a ratio. It's a kind of an assumed number. This, the amount of this stored version of, of fat that is moving through the blood on lipoproteins like chylomicron or VLDL or LDL. That's how the triglycerides are carried. And it's a fraction of those um, that we rely on to give us the number of the, the triglycerides number. Free fatty acids are products of fat metabolism. That's when the fat cells are breaking down their triglycerides, taking this, these fatty acids, three of them that are linked together, and pulling them off one at a time through a process called lipolysis. And so free fatty acids are a reflection of the amount of fat that's being broken down from fat cells to be burned by the body normally. And what happens is this, in, this, which is one of the reasons I love it so much, because it's both reflective of nutrient metabolism and it brings the target on the fat cell, which I think is initially the most important cell in the progression towards insulin resistance. So when insulin is high, as you noted in, in the lectures you learned about, um, insulin will inhibit fat breakdown. It inhibits lipolysis. So if an individual is eating a bagel, for example, their insulin is high, their free fatty acids will be low. That's what you'd see. Now give the person six or seven hours, insulin's all gone, they're now in a fasted state, insulin will be down and free fatty acids will start creeping up because there's this disinhibition of lipolysis. Now, in other words, lipolysis can operate freely. So these two should always be in opposites. If insulin's high, free fatty acids are down or vice versa. However, when the fat cell has undergone significant hypertrophy, it's grown. And this was somewhat reflective of how I started this conversation, saying that when the fat cell gets big, it becomes pro-inflammatory. It becomes pro-inflammatory to actually try to correct a reduction in blood flow as the fat cells are too far from blood vessels. But at the same time, as the fat cell has swelled to about 10 times its normal volume, which is, which is unlike any other cell in the body, no other cell is capable of that degree of, of hypertrophy in an adult. But at that point, the cell is getting so big that even though insulin keeps telling the fat cell to continue to grow, the fat cell stops listening and now starts leaking out fat. In other words, you now have a state where insulin is high reflective of the insulin resistant body, but now also free fatty acids are high, reflective of an insulin resistant fat cell. And if we appreciate the fact that the fat cell is probably the first cell to become insulin resistant, that test becomes probably the most sensitive or earliest indicator, the canary in the metabolic coal mine, warning the clinician, hey, this person doesn't have insulin resistance based on all these other tests that Ben just mentioned. Even their insulin might be at a normal-ish number, but if it's a normal-ish number and high free fatty acids, that's a worry. And so the, uh, the adipose IR index, which is what this is, will determine this. But it's interesting to note that there's differences. So anyone could look up this test, adipo-IR. Um, but men and women, the sexes have different numbers here because women naturally undergo lipolysis at a significantly higher rate than men do. Um, so women are naturally just burning fat at a slightly higher rate than men. So it, it, you take a healthy woman and a healthy man, her free fatty acid levels will naturally be higher than his. And so her adipo IR score naturally needs to be a little higher. So in women, the normal score is about nine. In men, the norm, well, that would be a warning if it's above nine, I should say. And in men, that number is much lower. It's about five because his free fatty acids should be lower. It's just one of the different, one of the many differences, of course, between men and women, which, which are real. You know, these are not the same sexes, not the same body type, but it's even reflected down to the very level of the biochemistry of the body and how the sexes use, uh, use energy. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think, first of all, for everybody listening, all clinicians you're all getting your lipid panel and stuff like that. So you can all do a triglyceride to HDL ratio. 
Ordering a fasting insulin is an easy test to order. Uh, you can use that number. Like Ben said, if it's over six, you need to be concerned. You can also, do you use the HOMA IR? Uh, right. Thank you so much. I, I meant to mention that one right after the fasting insulin. Yeah. So I would actually kind of put it in that order. Fasting insulin, okay. HOMA, and then all the others. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. And then, you know, when it comes to those free fatty acids that are leaking out of the now not healthy fat cell that has hypertrophy too much, then those free fatty acids need to go somewhere, right? And so they can't get into the adipose tissue because it has become insulin resistant. So then we start storing those free fatty acids in places where we're not supposed to be storing fats, right? Like in our muscle cells and in our liver and in around our heart and especially, blood vessels. Especially the liver. Yep, that's exactly yeah. right. Yep, because if insulin is high, which it is in this insulin resistant state, you can't burn those fats. That's the problem. Normally, if free fatty acids are going up in the blood, it's because insulin is low and so, insulin is low, and so the body's burning the fat very readily. Because right. as you noted, if, 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 if insulin is low, fat burning is elevated. And so right. in this case, be, to however, get our fuel to keep fuel level as it should you know, be where they should be. Yep. <laughs> but with insulin being high, the body can't burn that fat. It has to store it. Another reason why I'm so fascinated by insulin is because once again, insulin tells the body what to do with the energy that it has. And insulin abhors burning energy. It never wants to burn. It only wants to store. Right. So when I talk to patients about this and, and, you know, and I, I order the test, I usually order a fasting insulin, calculate their HOMA IR. That's usually what I do. And then I'll look at the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And so when I talk to them about having insulin resistance and I talk to them about their appetite levels, now tell me if I'm telling the correctly to my patients, but the way I kind of explain it is that when your insulin levels are always high, you're always in storage mode. And so in between meals, when you're supposed to be able to tap into your own adipose tissue, into your own fat cells as fuel, your body's not letting you do that because your insulin levels are always high. So soon after eating, you're hungry again because you can't tap into your fat in between meal. So you're kind of constantly yeah. in a storage mode and you can't tap into your stored fuels. This is, and that's one yeah, of the oh, reasons. Well said. Why well said. And we this is that's right. And it is documented. There is there are human studies to confirm everything you just said, including have groups of people eat two meals that are identical in calories and the one that elicits the higher insulin spike will invariably lead to greater hunger sooner. In other words, the yeah. person gets hungrier sooner compared to the other meal which had the same amount of calories but a more modest insulin spike. At the same time, another group, totally different lab, different study, found that when insulin spiked following a meal, the available ener the energy availability, they called it, which was the sum of all nutrients available in the blood, the sum of ketones, lactate, fatty acids, triglycerides, anything that could be a source of fuel, when they looked at the levels in the blood, when insulin spiked, they were all down. It followed, which, which makes sense because insulin wants right. to tuck everything away out of the blood. It wants to store it. And so what is in the blood goes down and that becomes a particular problem for the brain, which unlike muscle and liver and fat cells has no storage depot. It doesn't, you know, muscle and, and muscle and liver both have not only glycogen, but also triglyceride pools. And of course the fat cells have enormous triglyceride pools. The brain doesn't. So the brain is constantly dependent on the amount of energy that's available in the blood. And so if the energy in the blood starts to go down, the brain is panicking because it doesn't have its own reserve of energy it can rely on, unlike the other tissues I just mentioned. And so it starts demanding that the body start eating. In other words, promoting a sense of hunger, even though the person has hundreds of thousands of calories stored on their body, but the brain doesn't know that. It only can sense what's in the blood can't access it and it can, can't sense it. So yeah, I mean, I think that makes so much sense. And I think when I talk to my patients about the, it makes sense to them, right? And so then their next question is, okay, I understand. And then I also talk to them about, you know, the progression to type two diabetes, how insulin resistance happens probably 10 to 15 years before you ever start to see elevations in blood glucose, right? Fasting blood sugar stays normal for a long time. A1C stays normal for a long time while those insulin levels are rising, right? Because your your body's, yep. you know, th that's how it's compensating. And so, but it gets to the point where the pancreas just can't make any more insulin. And that only at that point 
uh, do we start to see blood glucose levels go up? And so I think a lot of people are confused when I say, you know, I want to test you for insulin resistance and all this. They say, oh no, my primary care doctor, they, they check my blood sugar. They said everything's fine. Or, or sometimes they say, oh, they told me to watch my sugars. And I look at their labs and they have full-blown prediabetes, but nobody's ever Mm -hmm. really mentioned it. They're just like, oh, just watch your blood sugars, but you're fine. You know? So anyway, so I have this conversation with them and all, and I, kind of tie it into their appetite and their weight. And, you know, things are really starting to make sense to the patient. And then of course, their next question is, what can I do about it? Right? How can we reverse this? So obviously, this would be a whole podcast episode in and of itself. But and you go into great detail. That's why I love your book so much, honestly, because there's so much information in there. uh, So many medical conditions that are affected by this, that you go into great detail about how it is that insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia contributes or exacerbates, you know, to the development of all of these medical conditions. But then you also go into a lot of details about, you know, what can we do about it? So could you list like maybe the top three things if we were, if either we have patients listening or providers who want to kind of know what are the top three things I can tell people to do to help reverse this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the conventional, I'll start this by just pointing out the problems with the conventional approach, which is the low calorie or low energy approach. The problem with the low energy approach isn't that the idea doesn't have merit. Restricting energy has merit where you want the person to use their own energy and shrink those fat cells, thereby improving, you know, there's fewer, there's less free fatty acids coming out and now the fat cells are more insulin sensitive and, and they're less pro-inflammatory, indeed even becoming anti-inflammatory. Um, There's value in scrutinizing energy, but if low energy is the first step of this journey to improving metabolic health, then we put the patient in a very difficult position where they start to run out of energy in their blood. If they're still, if the cut, if the calories they are eating are insulin spiking calories, even though they're eating fewer calories, it would potentially cause the situation I just described, which is that the total amount of energy available, the nutrients available in the blood drop, which starts pitting the patient against hunger and hunger always wins. These strategies don't work long term. Not that the strategy itself doesn't have merit, but it shouldn't be the first step. The first step should be, how can I lower my insulin without making myself hungry all the time? Where if insulin is low, you start using, you learn how to use your own body's energy for fuel, your own fat cells for fuel. And the best way, you'd mentioned sort of three things. I I, I believe there are three fundamental pillars, each reflective of one of the, or, or reflected in one of the macronutrients. So firstly, the first way to help a patient reduce their insulin, thereby becoming more insulin sensitive and accelerating metabolic rate and losing weight more easily is to control carbohydrates. Now I'm not saying we don't eat any, but, and there are some nice ways to implement this idea or to put it into practice. And that is don't get carbohydrates that come in bags and boxes with barcodes. Let your carbohydrates come as whole fruits and vegetables. You eat them, you don't drink them, and then you can enjoy them freely. You don't even need to count anything. Just let that be the first step. Control your carbohydrates, and that will help your insulin come down. But as you're restricting your carbohydrates and likely eating less, then at the same time, you want to make up for that so you're not hungry all the time, and so eat more protein and fat. So the next two rules, prioritize protein and don't fear fat. That one is important. It's easy to prioritize protein. We generally, culturally, we appreciate protein, although now more and more there's a fear of protein, which is very, very silly and not at all based in science. So get high quality protein, ideally from animal sources, regular, frequently. At the same time, acknowledge that in nature, all of those high quality, best proteins for humans to eat come with fat. They are invariably connected in nature. That's how we should eat them. Don't fear the fat that comes with those proteins and even be a little liberal with fat when it comes to butter, et cetera. Don't fear fat. And then, so if we, if a patient incorporates those three ideas, that will help lower their insulin. And and again, the body becomes more insulin sensitive. They're burning fat as a fuel more frequently, learning how to burn their own fat for fuel. And then once they've adjusted to that new routine and that new plateau that they've come to, then they can take that next step of, all right, I'm not quite where I want to get. I have more improvements and I know it. This has gotten me really far, but I want to go a little further. Now you can take that next step by starting to scrutinize total energy coming in a little bit. But not that you're counting calories, 
the best way to restrict energy in my mind is with structured fasting. And so that ends up being the kind of fourth part of this following. Once you've learned how to manage your macronutrients, now learn to manage hunger signals and eating windows and being very disciplined. But as much as I'm an advocate of fasting and I am, people need to know that how you end a fast is much more important than how long you fast. Too often, someone just shrugs their shoulders and decides to do a 24 or 36 hour fast and they have no real plan in place, no structure for when they end their fast, what they're going to do. And so they end up just turning their fasts into these kind of glamorous versions of a binge purge cycle. They binge because they're so hungry. They overeat and they are really uncomfortable. They are sh ashamed of what they did. Then they just resolve to do better the next day. And they just do the same thing again and again and again. So um, as much as I'm an advocate of fasting, it behooves all of us to pay a lot of attention to our habits, be honest, and have a plan for the fast. And it would be better to do a shorter fast and manage your eating at the end of that fast than do a longer fast and just kind of go crazy on eating anything you can get your hands on. Right. And that kind of bothers me sometimes with some of the fasting and the intermittent fasting studies. They're not, oftentimes they're really just looking at the amount of time that people are abstaining from food and they're not looking at what the type of food is that's being consumed during that time. And I'm like, well, that <laughs> is such an important part of it. I realize you're throwing in another variable, but it's so important. And, and thank you for saying what you just said, because you really kind of validated how I approach my patients. I say, they're always so surprised when I say, I'm not worried about calories at first, because I need you to start burning your own fat. And then, then a lot of times what I find with patients is once they're able to lower their insulin levels and they have better access to their own fat as a fuel source, they're just less hungry. So then we talk about, mm -hmm. you know, maybe right now they're eating every two hours because they're insulin resistant and they're getting hungry every two hours. And then as we get them more sensitive, as we get their insulin levels down, now all of a sudden they're finding, oh, I forgot to eat my afternoon snack. Oh, I, I'm not really hungry then anymore. Great. So let's let's cut, let's pay more attention to that and let's not eat if we're not hungry. And the next thing you know, half of my patients are like, is it okay if I skip breakfast? I'm not really hungry in the yep. morning anymore. So yep. a lot of times it kind of evolves naturally. Um, but I think, you know, explaining the process and you do that so beautifully, you explain all of this so well and in a way that makes sense to people. So even just listening to you talk about these things has helped me with how I communicate these things with my patients. Um, so thank you so Love much. It. Nothing, I think nothing, we could nothing, talk nothing warms all day. <laughs> nothing warms a professor's heart more than seeing that a lesson has stuck with a student. Love it. <laughs> It certainly has. And, and thank you so much. It's just been such a joy to, you know, get to introduce you and talk to you at the Obesity Medicine Association at the Illinois Obesity Society. So thank you so much for joining me here today. I'll make sure to put in a link to your book because I think every, literally, I brought it to my primary care provider and I think every medical professional should read the book, Why We Get Sick and What We Can Do About It. And so I will put a link to that um, in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to um, leave with us or the audience for last words? Well, this was my this was my pleasure, Carly. It's always fun meeting up with you. And I look forward to many, many, many more years of professional interaction at meetings and so on. Um, people can find me on social media. I typically try to put out a couple little lessons each week um, on particularly Instagram. And I'm sharing articles on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, but also I contribute regularly, regularly blog posts at the website called Get Health, G-E-T-H-L-T-H, -T no vowels in health, H-L-T-H dot com. All right, perfect. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And I know I'm not huge on social media, but I do like LinkedIn and I always love the articles you share. So please keep sharing those and keep educating all of us. And thank you so much for everything you do. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the Gaining Health Podcast. Don't forget to review and subscribe. And if you really liked it, consider supporting us on Patreon. Lastly, if you need resources and tools to help you start an obesity management program, be sure to check out gaininghealth.com. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on the Gaining Health Podcast.